Time Magazine named him as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. A New York Times best-selling author of several books, Dean Carnassus is perhaps the most recognized ultra runner in the world. Dean, thank you for taking the time to discuss your latest book, The Road to Sparta, and we'll also discuss running and life in general. Welcome to the Two Minute Time Out. Thanks for having me run by. <laughs> Why the latest book about your Greek origins and going to Greece and running? You know, you introduced me as Dean Carnassus, but um, my real name is Constantine Nicholas Carnassus. So that, that would, I think, uh, foretell that I'm 100% Greek. And, you know, the marathon originated in ancient Greece at the Battle of Marathon uh, back in 490 uh, BCE. And I was fascinated by the story and wanted to learn more, wanted to learn the real truth, kind of wanted to learn about where I came from as well. And that was kind of the, the discovery that I, I launched on when, uh, when undertaking this book. Well, the Cliff Notes version, the average person says, yeah, the marathon, there was this guy who he ran after this battle and he ran 26 miles and he told the Greek people that we won and then he died. And that was that's the story. That's why they have a marathon. Not exactly that way, is it? <laughs> it's, it's, there are many more twists and turns to the story, just as uh, there were many twists and turns with ancient Greece. Yeah, indeed. He, you know, the Pheidippides, as he was named, with, whose name literally means spare the horse, because this man could outrun a horse. He actually ran um, 153 miles prior to the marathon to recruit the uh, Spartans. So he ran from Athens to Sparta and then back from Sparta to Athens before the final marathon was run. So he had every right to die. <laughs> of course, you were in Greece. You ran this 153-mile race. From reading the book, the reaction of people in Greece were just tremendous. Everyone wanted your autograph. I thought it was interesting how during the race, people want autographs and interviews and pictures. And I know that can be a little bit irritating when you're running a race and, and people want to get involved. But what was that like? Yeah, well, I hope I captured that in the book. I mean, how juxtaposed an experience it was. Here I am, you know, running 153 miles continuous. So for you listeners, that means nonstop in sub 36 hours. So you're basically running through the, you know, southern Mediterranean hills of Greece in late summer. So it's very hot and you're trying to get to Sparta within 36 hours. You know, I'm kind of a recognized quantity in Greece. Um, kind of a, <laughs> I was welcomed to Greece as kind of one of the countrymen, if you will. So I'm being stopped a along the way with people who have copies of my books and magazines that are, you know, I'm in, in the, the grips of this most grueling endurance run of my life. And you know, I come around a corner and there's a crowd of people wanting autographs. It was just a really comical experience in some ways, endearing experience in other ways, and frustrating experience in other ways. Dean, what is so magical about 26.2 miles? Of course, in your case, it's more than 26.2. What is it about 26.2? You know, uh, Joe, I like to say there's there's magic and misery. And to a lot of people, you know, they're scratching their heads saying, well, hold it, <laughs> I hate being miserable. What, you know, what are you talking about? To a marathoner, I think they understand it. The marathon demands a lot from you. It's not easy. There's no way to fake your way through a marathon, through 26.2 miles. You've got to earn it. And it hurts. And it's going to test you. And it's going to try you. And anyone who's reached the finish line of a marathon knows what an incredible feeling of accomplishment it is to have that medal put around your neck. And, you know, that's something that stays with you your entire life. You say that in an ultra marathon, the first half, your legs carry you. In the second half, your mind carries you. Can you explain that? Yeah, I think at a point, especially during a, a you know a continuous 153 mile foot race where you're running you know for 34, 35 hours, the body at a point reaches a level of complete exhaustion and cannot carry forward. And I think at that point, it's really a mental battle more so than a physical battle. Uh, with this particular race, the Spartathlon, it's even complicated further in that there are very strict cutoff times that you have to make certain milestones by or else you get eliminated from the race. Typically, there are 500 of the most elite athletes in the world that compete in this event, and only about a third of them actually even finish. So imagine a race that's so grueling that only a third of the, the starters actually even reach the finish line. You also say that I want people to know that I don't always succeed. People hear of your accomplishments and say, I could never do that. But there are times when you really things haven't gone well for you, have they, in races? 
No, they haven't. And, and in fact, I celebrate those moments. I think I've learned a lot more from my failures than my successes. I mean, you know, when you succeed, you tend to just, you know, high five and have a glass of champagne. When you fail, you tend to reflect on the currents and you tend to analyze and self-analyze what went wrong. And I think that's when you have some of your greatest learnings is through failure. With ultra marathoning, it's very symbolic because you're going to fail. When you set out to run 100 or even further miles continuously, there are going to be times when you can't finish. And that's really what I like. Life is rarely so black and white. You know, the rules change on us. The finish line gets shifted around. You never really know. A lot of failures are just kind of soft failures. Uh, with ultra marathoning, it's, it's crystal clear, the rules of engagement. You know, there's a starting point. 100 miles from there, there's a finish point. You know, you get to that finish point you succeed. If you don't, you fail. And there's just going to be a point where you don't make it. And I think those are some of the greatest learnings I've ever had. You look at the fact that you're now approaching 55 years of age, and do you see yourself moving away from the competitive aspect of running and maybe more as an ambassador? Absolutely. Thankfully, I still have my health. I've never suffered an injury. I, I still feel like a teenager. As far as my strength and endurance, I still feel like it's there. But I do feel like my speed is decreasing. Instead of ending up on the podium these days, that's less of what I look for as my goal as much as trying to inspire other people and trying to educate and encourage other people to be the best that they can be. And as well, as you mentioned, the uh, kind of the ambassador role. Interesting, this last summer, I served as a, um, a U.S. athlete ambassador to Central Asia. Asia. So the U.S. State Department sent me to run across Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan to celebrate 25 years of diplomatic relations with these countries as a sports envoy. So that was a very new role for me, and I really, really enjoyed it. And it was one of the most successful programs the State Department's ever hosted. There has been some criticism of your running accomplishments, and you've addressed those in, in some interviews we did before. They talk about self-promotion. How do you respond to that and you know, your feelings about someone who is critical of that? I'm personally one of the guys that read a lot of my criticism, and I also read the <laughs> reviews of my books. You know, a lot of authors I know just say, don't read that stuff. It's just going to tear you apart. Thankfully, 99.9% .9 of the stuff I read is all really positive. Occasionally, there are, there's critique, and I have to be honest, I've learned a lot from it. So I, I read this stuff, and some of it I think is on, is, is right on point. Other stuff, when you read these comments by someone named Toe Jam that's just attacking my character more than an issue, they're not even willing to use their own. <laughs> <laughs> their own name. If they use a moniker, I mean, you know, I don't think that's very legitimate. So my skin is growing a little bit thicker, but I still read all the feedback I get. And I think a lot of it is from people that don't know me and mischaracterize me. You know, I think when you reach a certain level of notoriety, you know, you become bigger than you really are. You can talk to the people that know me best, my family, and they'll say, you know, <laughs> my husband, my father is just a humble guy. He's just a dad like every other dad. Eric had a question. He says, when you're done running an event and it's finally time to lie down and get some sleep, what do you do to hydrate and get your body chemistry squared away? And also, so your muscles don't seize up into one massive head-to-toe cramp. <laughs> These are good questions. You know, what, what do you do? Well, the, the first thing you do is you train like crazy going into the event because I've noticed that the better trained you are, the recovery afterward, you know, that kind of a, the car wreck afterwards is minimized. You try to take proactive steps. The other thing you do is you don't just drink water. You drink electrolytes to replenish, you know, the sodium and potassium that is lost from sweat. So you try to manage your, your electrolyte balance. I don't use any sort of anti-inflammatories. And I used to. I used to take a lot of, you know, Motrin or ibuprofen uh, to try and reduce the cramping. I found that I recover much better and I have a lot less cramping now that I don't take that stuff, which might seem a little counterintuitive. So I lay off the drugs completely. You know, the other thing, and this is going to sound bizarre, but a real miracle for muscle cramping is pickle juice. And I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of endurance athletes use pickle juice. And without the pickle juice, I don't know if it's the tanginess or the sodium in there, but that'll break a cramp like you wouldn't believe. Short answer in a couple of these. Do you think the two hour marathon will ever be broken? I do. I think that a couple things that they're, they're looking at, one is to hold it in a place below sea level, such as the Dead Sea, where there's more oxygen available. The other thing they're looking at is when ideally to start a marathon. As you know, all of the records that have been set, the marathon starts typically at 8 in the morning. Now, the human body is not necessarily at athletic peak at 8 in the morning. The circadian rhythms are not necessarily where they should be for extreme ultimate sports performance. So they're looking at starting this race between 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. PM. And it wouldn't even actually be a race. It would be just a point to point, 26.2, below sea level with no wind. It's going to take a lot of factors to come together, but potentially it could be done. 
your amount of mileage every year, how many shoes do you run through? <laughs> I do about 30 or 40 pairs of shoes a, a year. I work with a company called The North Face, and I do a lot of quote-unquote trail running, so running in, in wilderness trails. And I do a lot of what's called wear testing, where I wear the shoes for a certain number of miles, and then I write up a report about how they performed, how they weared. So some of the shoes that I go through still only might be 60 or 70% done, but I still turn them back in. But it's typically about 30 to 40 pair a year. I've seen several videos of you on YouTube, and do I see you running with traffic, which is dangerous and also against the law? You know, it's funny. It depends on where you're at. Some states and some countries, they have you run with traffic. Others, it's against traffic. So I always try to stay within the boundaries of law. Given my preference, I don't like running on roads. I prefer trails where there are no cars. But if I am running with traffic, if I have my choice and it's legal, I prefer to run against traffic. I always say I like to see death coming at me. <laughs> As you look back in your years of running, can you relate a funny or bizarre story? Well, I've certainly had tons of encounters. I mean, I've nearly stepped on dozens of rattlesnakes. You know, I've had bear encounters. But I, there's a story of doing an all-night training run out here in, uh, in California on some backcountry roads uh, out in a place called Western Marin County. And running at about 2.15 in the morning, I learned you've got to keep your eyes out because the bars let out at 2 a.m. And people start using these backcountry routes because they don't want to use the main thoroughfares because they've been doing something they shouldn't be doing. They're driving. Well, you know, I was out there running. It was about 2.15 in the morning, and, I, and a car comes whizzing around the corner heading right for me which is not that unusual. I mean, who's expecting to find a, a jogger out here at, you know, 2.15 in the morning? But I'm pretty lit up. I mean, I have a headlamp on, a handheld flashlight, you know, I've got a reflective vest. Well, this car keeps coming straight for me. So when that happens, I typically just shine my uh, handheld flashlight in their windshield just to alert them that, hey, there's a guy running out here. Uh, I did that, and they still didn't divert. And now they're coming right for me, this car. And I thought, okay, just jump off the road. Well, I turned to jump off the road, and there's a solid embankment next to me. So there's nowhere to jump. And now I'm kind of doing that head fake with this two-ton mass of steel that's just barreling at me at 50 miles an hour. And I kind of twisted to my left and whoosh, I mean, this car went by so close, I could feel the heat of its radiator on my thighs. I mean, it was that close. And, you know, I stood there just thankful to be alive. And then I got a bit upset. I thought, you know, that person saw me. I mean, they were playing kind of cat and mouse with me. And that was, that's just not fair. I'm a runner. So I gave them a fist, closed fist. I didn't have any digits extended. And they hit the brakes. And I thought, oh, man, why did I do that? And then they put the car in reverse. And I thought, oh, this is it. I mean, there's there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. I'm, I've met my destiny out here in the middle of the night on this backcountry road in the middle of nowhere. Well, this car comes screeching to a halt right next to me. And this manic woman, she jumps out of the driver's seat. She runs around the front of the car. She whips open the passenger side door. And she starts rifling through this bag that's on the seat. And I mean, I'm standing there, Joe, paralyzed in fear, thinking, you know, is it a knife? Is it a gun? I mean, what is she going to pull out of there? <laughs> she pulled out a copy of my book. <laughs> and there's a picture of me on the front of my book. And she looks at the picture and she looks at me and she says, oh, my God, you're him. You're the ultra marathon guy. Oh, it's so ironic. My boyfriend just loves you. You got to sign a copy of his book. <laughs> and I'm looking at this woman going, this is not happening. And I'm trembling. She put the pen in my hand and she says, oh, yeah, his name is Bob. Say something inspirational. And I felt like writing, Bob, uh, your girlfriend is a complete psycho. Get out of this relationship. But I signed the book, gave it back to her, and she said, oh, that'll make him so happy. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And she just threw the book back in the car. She slammed the passenger side door. She ran around, got back in, and just drove off into the night. <laughs> so that remains my most terrifying running moment. That is incredible. Well, Dean, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you once again. Amazon is talking about delivering packages with drones, and I'm thinking the possibility of you actually delivering packages running. And, of course, we talked before we started this interview about you delivering pizza also, just like the time you had pizza <laughs> delivered to you. So there's a great opportunity. You could be doing that. I think I've got a second career. Good talking to you, Dean. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me Once on. Once again, thank you very much.